Hello, everyone. This is uh, week eight of the ENM 2020 course um, that is led by Dan Peterson. And uh, this is part of the uh, module on um, environmental data that uh, are used in ecological niche modeling. So the previous week, last week, um, you had two talks, uh, one of an overview of environmental data by Sarah, and then another uh, more in-depth talk uh, on climate data by Dirk. And if you paid attention, if you participated or paid attention to uh, the questions and answers uh, answers session uh, right after the, uh, at the end of that week of last week, um, Sarah and Town and I um, talked a bit, spent a bit of time talking about um, the issues with the course resolution of climate data and how the course resolution of, of climate data limits the kinds of questions we can, we can address. So this, my, my presentation here is a very quick um, and short introduction to uh, remote sensing uh, and some of the data that, that we can use from remote sensing or remotely sensed data that we can use in ecological niche modeling, but also um, kind of um, be aware <laughs> uh, uh, presentation um, because there are, there are limitations uh, of uh, uses of remotely sensed data in ecological niche modeling. And I'll go um, in a bit more detail. And I'll also provide the list of um, most commonly used or data that uh, remotely, sen remotely sensed data that are most, most commonly used in niche modeling or data that um, I have uh, worked with in the past or I have come uh, across and that I think uh, could be useful uh, for many of you. So there will be a list of links and um, you can click on those links and explore those data. So I will start uh, with um, kind of a very uh, brief <laughs> and uh, very simple introduction to uh, what we mean by remote sensing. Um, of course, remote sensing can mean um, remotely uh, observing organisms, but we are not talking about that here. I'm not uh, talking about that. Um, I'm talking about specifically sensors that are used uh, to um, sense or record some information about the um, surface uh, of the Earth. So the two uh, big classes of sensors that are used uh, for this pers uh, purpose are uh, passive remote sensors and active remote sensors. So the passive remote sensors, as the word uh, passive uh, may indicate, don't, um, don't interact with, uh, with the Earth. They, uh, they just record the uh, uh, light, uh, the energy, the solar energy that is reflected uh, or the energy that is emitted by, uh, by the Earth uh, and the interaction between Earth and atmosphere. So this uh, little diagram that is pretty old. Uh, since I was in grad school, I came across this one and I, um, I really liked the simplicity of, uh, of the illustration, but the, the diagram simply shows that we have incoming uh, solar um, um, energy that uh, reaches the surface, first the atmosphere and then the surface of the earth and the various um, uh, objects or surfaces on the earth. And then from those surfaces, the tree, the grass, the uh, the building, uh, part of the light that hits those, uh, those objects is then reflected back um, through the atmosphere and the sensors on a satellite, for example, in this case, will capture that amount of uh, solar radiation that is reflected. So these are uh, the passive sensors that, like I said, they record uh, light uh, solar radiation uh, reflected off uh, various surfaces of the earth, well, and of course, in interaction with the atmosphere. And then active remote sensors um, actually send uh, beams of uh, radiation, of light, and then they uh, measure the amount of energy radiation that is backscattered or uh, returned or bounces off, let's say, uh, surfaces. So uh, if you are familiar with um, LIDAR technology, that's how this is, um, a, a LIDAR sensor is a, an example of an active remote uh, sensor. And the figure uh, um, in, on this um, slide shows you 
the uh, footprint of, of um, um, LIDAR over a um, um, plot of forest. So what it shows is the, the volume of the forest that the uh, active remote sensor, uh, the LIDAR is, is uh, observing or recording. And then on the left side of the image, you see the uh, elevation and then the height above ground. So elevation uh, of, of the surface of the uh, earth, but uh, also what is on top of that surface the vegetation. So the height above ground is the vegetation above ground. So um, these are more recent, let's say, um, the more recent uh, technology that has been, uh, has been developed. So there are these active sensors, uh, passive uh, sensors, um, the big, two big categories. Um, and if you are interested uh, and curious about what is out there, <laughs> what kind of um, sensors are orbiting the Earth. Um, so I'm talking about the, just the satellite uh, remote sensing. Um, of course, there's airborne, uh, airborne from uh, airplane remote sensing and drone remote sensing more, more recently. But if we focus on just the, or the, the bulk of uh, remote sensing, which is uh, satellite bound, um, there is a very nice uh, or very interesting and complete, uh, a complex uh, database of um, satellites and missions that are uh, orbiting uh, the Earth, uh, but also uh, uh, missions that have been approved and missions that are considered um, to be for approval. So as you can see, uh, I have these three bullet points. Um, there's a lot <laughs> out there. There are a lot of sensors out there sensing the Earth, um, over 170 sensors. Um, and um, there are many more that are uh, missions that have been approved uh, and missions that are considered. Now, of course, these are international, uh, many, many countries, several <laughs> to many countries. And there are many of these satellites um, um, measure uh, properties or characteristics that are not necessarily um, useful or we cannot incorporate in ecological niche modeling. So, there's a lot of information that is collected, but it doesn't mean most of it, a large, large part of it, we cannot, we cannot actually use. But just to give you a set, an idea of, of um, diversity of remote sensing, and this is just satellite uh, remote sensing that, that uh, is happening as we speak. So you can um, go on that uh, database and have fun with it. You can, um, you can see um, the types of, of um, data that uh, are collected or will be collected. And then um, there is a list of, um, a list of satellite uh, sensors that, are, um, that can, you can search um, out of um, ITC in Netherlands. Uh, Netherlands. Um, and uh, that, uh, that list is focused mostly on optical sensors, whereas this, um, database uh, maintained by the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites is um, just a broad, um, all-encompassing type of uh, database. Okay, so back to the, these uh, passive uh, remote sensors, um, which I said uh, collect the uh, amount or record the amount of um, radiant energy that is uh, reflected or emitted by Earth and the atmosphere. Um, so it, I'm showing you another figure that is, um, I forgot to put the, the uh, textbook that, um, from which I took the, the uh, figure, but, or took a picture of the figure. But the, the point of showing you this figure is to understand that, or get an idea, get a sense for how complex this process actually is, uh, this technology, <laughs> um, and how many uh, sources of error exist um, in um, acquiring this kind of information. So you have, uh, again, the um, source of, of energy, the sun, um, that first uh, has to um, go through uh, the atmosphere, and some of it is um, scattered in that process. Some of that energy is scattered, um, returned back, uh, but some does, uh, does um, go through the atmosphere, or a, a good part of it goes through the atmosphere, and then uh, reaches the uh, uh, surface of the Earth. 
So you have solar radi uh, radiation at the surface. So you see, um, we'll talk about what the x-axis is, but it's a wavelength. Uh, and then you have um, energy reflected back. Some of it um, is um, absorbed or scattered in the atmosphere, uh, atmospheric layer, and then um, some of it is uh, finally uh, reaching the sensor on, on this um, satellite. So there are things that need to happen or processes that need to happen, um, data processes that need to happen in order for us to actually use this information. So there is one, um, one type of information that we can, we can retrieve from, from uh, these sensors, and that's the top of the atmosphere radiance. Um, and then with atmospheric correction, uh, so taking into account um, the scattering, the uh, reflection, the absorption that happens uh, in the um, atmospheric layer, so we need that atmospheric correction to actually see, uh, uh, get to, or estimate the amount of um, reflect and, uh, light reflected at the surface uh, of the Earth. So this atmospheric correction is quite a, quite a sticky point and difficult point, uh, but much needed. So once that is done, then we can actually talk about properties or, uh, or um, quantities, uh, variables that, that are useful uh, for biologists, ecologists, and um, we can use some of them in each modeling. So temperature, of course, um, at surface um, is, um, is one important uh, variable, and then there are uh, more ecosystem type variables or functional type variables, for example, chlorophyll A. So um, there is a lot of post pre and post processing of data, um, uh, various levels, level one, two, three of, of processing uh, the data uh, for, in order for us to actually make, make use uh, of um, data collected by these sensors. Okay, so I mentioned the electromagnetic uh, magnetic spectrum, and I wanted to just briefly, uh, very briefly mention, well, this is the, the full electromagnetic spectrum, uh, and then the, but the portions of the electromagnetic spectrum that are uh, important for biological uh, processes are in the visible spectrum, uh, and then in, um, infrared spectrum. And the, the infrared spectrum is divided in near infrared and shortwave infrared. But um, basically, the um, electromagnetic spectrum between 400, the visible seven, uh, to 700, 4 to 700, and then near infrared um, 700 nanometers to about 1,000. And then beyond that, the shortwave infrared, uh, about 2,500 nanometers. That's that's what in um, um, passive remote sensing, op uh, when we talk about optical sensors, that's the, the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we are interested in. So from 400 nanometers to 2,500 nanometers, we are interested in that, because that portion of the spectrum, because that's where vegetation is active, that's where pigments are reflecting or absorbing uh, light, there is uh, water reflection, uh, water absorption, sorry, not reflection, water absorption in the leaves and in the uh, vegetation material. Um, so this, this is what we call the full spectrum from 400 to 2,500 nanometers, in, and that's where um, the remote sensing, optical remote sensing uh, is uh, focused on. So on the uh, right side of, of this slide, I'm showing why this is, why do we care about, about the wavelength, uh, the portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, um, and what, what do we do with that, uh, with that um, knowledge or information about amount of light uh, reflected or um, energy or solar radiation reflected uh, versus absorbed. So you have the wavelength uh, on the x-axis. So here's in micrometers, which is um, a bit confusing because over here we have it in nanometers uh, versus uh, micrometers, but it's again from visible, uh, in the visible spectrum for, for, uh, from 400 uh, to um, 700 nanometers, and then near infrared. Um, it stops right here in, in the near infrared. It doesn't go into the shortwave infrared um, into the 2,500, up to 2,500. It stops at 1,200, this one. So what we have are 
um, we have absorption of chlorophyll. Um, so if you look at pine woods and grasslands, uh, you see, uh, you see a, um, an absorption uh, here. So reflectance is low over here and low over here where we have um, active chlorophyll actively absorbing uh, the light for photosynthesis. So, so we, can, um, we can see where um, vegetation like pine woods and grasslands are active. And then the, the difference, for example, um, an in, inert material, red sand peat, uh, and then uh, silty water. So the, the point of this graph is to show that there are differences between, differences among all these categories, but then there are also differences because two are vegetation categories and uh, one, the other, uh, one is water and the other one is, uh, is sand or sand peat. But also within uh, pine woods and grasslands, we, we, have, uh, we see that the amount of light reflected uh, varies or is different between these two classes of vegetation across the electromagnetic spectrum. So that's how uh, land cover classification happens um, <laughs> because of different reflective properties of different surfaces, but also because of uh, different bandwidths um, these narrow uh, channels or narrow, narrow bandwidth at which um, absorption uh, happens or reflection happens. Okay, and that whole, all has to do with the amount of chlorophyll, the amount of uh, pigments, if the vegetation is, um, is uh, drying, stressed, uh, seasonality, so on and so forth. Okay, so enough about vegetation. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention. Um, Another, so there's the um, kind of technical characteristics uh, have to do with active uh, re uh, remote sensing and passive remote sensing. Um, the, for passive remote sensing or optical sensors, the electromagnetic spectrum and the portion of the spectrum at which uh, the sensors are, um, are recording um, energy, radiant energy or, or light. But then um, there's also the spectral resolution, another technical detail that is quite important for these um, optical sensors. So spectral resolution has to do with how, the, uh, um, how sensitive the sensors are, sensors are to the, um, the light um, or the, um, I should say, solar radiation um, reflected. So we have again the wavelength, this time in nanometers, this time going from visible all the way to um, a short wave, wave infrared, 2400-ish, uh, <laughs> should be 2500. Anyways, and then we have uh, reflectance on the y-axis. And the two, the two curves or the two lines show you um, two different uh, satellites or the, the sensors, two different sensors uh, from two different satellites. Uh, Hyperion in green, which is what we call um, hyperspectral sensor because it has um, over 200 uh, narrow bands in the bands are about 10 nanometers or 10 nanometers and then we have the MODIS uh, sensor which is uh, quite uh, has seen quite a lot of use it's one of the the most used um, sensors in uh, ecology and I'll show you some types of data that uh, or products that are derived from MODIS um, from the MODIS sensor so MODIS has, MODIS sensor is what we call a multispectral, so it has several bands. Um, so we call that a moderate uh, spectral uh, resolution sensor. So we have in red uh, a curve that uh, connects, the, uh, connects the dots or the bands uh, that the MODIS sensor has. So you see that um, there are uh, a, handful of uh, a handful of bands um, in uh, the black dots um, scattered across the, or spread across the uh, visible and uh, near infrared. And then Hyperion, we see that it's a continuous curve because every 10, uh, every 10 nanometers, there is a measurement. So the, the sensor, the hyperspectral sensor has um, channels for every 10 nanometers, whereas the MODIS has several 
channels for wider um, uh, bands. So what this means is that the same, this is a, a, a 30 by 30 meter uh, vegetation pixel. So the same uh, surface on the ground can be represented by a very uh, well-defined curve, the green one, the hyperspectral um, data set, uh, or a kind of a choppy uh, line uh, of some sort that is represented by MODIS. So this is one pixel. Now, if you imagine several pixels um, of different vegetation types, the more information we have, the more, the more spectral information we have, the more likely we are to uh, separate those pixels based on, um, let's say, amount of um, uh, active chlorophyll or amount of um, senescent pigments which are, uh, which are um, active in about um, one, um, 600, uh, 1,600 to 1,800, depending on the uh, pig, uh, on the pigments and then even uh, farther in the uh, shortwave infrared. So the more, the more bands, the more um, spectral information we have, the more um, we can do with these data. So that was a long explanation of a technical detail, uh, but um, getting, so that was our <laughs> uh, quick uh, introduction to or quick uh, crash course on remote sensing, but getting back to why we are discussing um, remote sensing, um, the types of data or types of remote sensing products that we can use uh, in um, our ecological niche models. But what I want to make sure that you think about is um, the temporal and spatial resolution of the data that you are using uh, in ecological niche modeling. So say you, you want to use maybe some climate data in combination with, with the remotely sensed data, or even if you don't, even if you decide I'm going to use just remotely sensed uh, variables in my ecological niche model, you still have to consider what is the temporal and spatial resolution of your presence data. And those two obviously have to match. The two types of data, let's say we have occurrence data um, that we want to match with satellite uh, variables. Uh, we have to be very careful, careful about when these data were collected. So both presence data, when were the presence data collected, uh, when were the satellite data uh, collected, and then the spatial resolution. Because if we have um, very um, coarse resolution of, or I should say uh, the uncertainty of the presence data is high, and we try to match that with fine resolution satellite data, that's, gonna, that's going to be hard. So if we have, uh, for example, a museum specimen that has been georeferenced um, based on a locality description of where the museum specimen was collected, that kind of assignment of latitude and longitude to a locality, which we'll talk about later in the course, the georeferencing of occurrences. But the assignment of latitude and longitude uh, for that collecting locality comes with some error. And that some error can be small to actually kilometers, um, um, as large as a few uh, to, I don't know, many kilometers. So in that situation, having those kinds of presence data, uh, we we cannot, we cannot make use of, we cannot combine those presence data with um, satellite data. Because satellite, if satellite data are at 30 meter resolution or uh, 250 uh, meter resolution, then we have no idea if we cannot say for sure that the record we are using for presence um, matches the location of the, uh, that pixel of uh, satellite information. So, I see, sometimes I see a lot of interest and a lot of uh, enthusiasm, and I'm super enthusiastic about using remotely sensed data, but we do have to be very careful and temper our, our enthusiasm and be very careful about matching, especially matching occurrence data, presence data, or presence absence data, matching that um, accuracy resolution to the uh, satellite data. Now, the temporal aspect is also complicated because uh, you will see in the next few slides, satellite data became, um, we have more uh, satellite data available um, from the past, let's say 20 years. 
And those of you who work with museum specimen data or GBIF data, we have a hodgepodge of, we have a very heterogeneous um, presence data set from, with, uh, with presences collected from the 1950s, 60s, uh, so on and so forth. So those data, again, um, those presence data cannot be used, those historical presence data cannot be used with current uh, satellite um, uh, variables. So again, very, be very careful about the um, matching, how uncertain your uh, occurrence data, how specific your latitude, how um, correct your latitude and longitude assignment is to uh, presences. And then what, when were these presences collected? Um, and you might, you might not be able, you might have to lose some of the occurrences or actually lose the satellite, um, satellite variables or satellite derived variables. Okay, so <clears throat> because I mentioned spatial and temporal resolution, I have a figure here from a textbook. It's not a very good, uh, <laughs> Um, resolution, this, this uh, uh, image doesn't have a very good resolution, but I decided to still keep it in because I didn't have a, a better um, representation of what I mean by spatial and temporal resolution. So on the um, y-axis, we have temporal resolution. So how frequent are these uh, satellite, um, and in this case, it's not just satellite, this is also uh, aerial, so from an airplane, uh, aerial imagery. Um, but how often are these remotely uh, sensed um, data collected? So we have minutes to hours on the y-axis, on the temporal, the um, vertical axis. Uh, so we start with minutes, hours, days, um, and then we get into years. So data that are collected once a year, five times a year, uh, or, or sorry, every five years, so on and so forth. And so that's the temporal resolution, how frequent the, um, the data are collected. And then on the x-axis, you, you see the spatial resolution and it, it starts submeter, so from uh, uh, 0.2, so 200 centimeters uh, all the way to one meter. And you see that these are these high resolution, um, the pixel size, very, very small. These high resolution data are generally um, aerial or airborne. Um, data. So that means that there's a camera that is mounted on an airplane and the air, airplane is flow at, flown at low altitude and that's how that resolution um, is acquired, that's high spatial res uh, resolution is acquired. And so this book is from 2011 or the, uh, the figure that I have uh, is from a book from textbook from 2011. It doesn't include uh, for example UAVs, um, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles or drones, but they would be also in this high uh, spatial resolution. And then you can collect them, um, I, I, not every minute, but you can collect them uh, every few days, um, depending on uh, every few months or twice a year or so on. So that's why this is a long uh, column for, for um, aerial uh, photography. But then we get, so we have this at this end of the spectrum, the high, high resolution, uh, we have meters. And then um, at the under, other end of the spectrum, we have, this is one kilometer resolution. Uh, and then it goes to um, five kilometer resolution, 10 kilometer resolution. So these are uh, coarser uh, resolution data that are collected uh, very frequently. So you see that they are uh, low on the y-axis. So they are collected, uh, very, very frequently because these are actually meteorological uh, satellites that are used to make, uh, to, uh, to forecast uh, for weather forecasting. So they require um, high temporal frequency. They are collected very, very often, uh, but the spatial resolution is, is coarse. So some, in between this, um, a very frequent data collection, so high temporal resolution. And you know, in between the two uh, very high spatial resolution and very coarse spatial resolution, we have the bulk of, uh, of data. So you see Landsat here uh, in the middle. So uh, the spatial resolution of uh, Landsat is 30 meters for certain bands and up to 100 meters for, I think the thermal band on, on Landsat is, is coarser. So we have um, 
the bulk of the remote sensing, um, at least the one, uh, the remote sensing data that is captured by this, by this um, uh, figure, the bulk is somewhere in the middle of the spatial resolution and also in the middle of temporal resolution. So the frequency, how often um, data are collected. So for example, Landsat, uh, orbit, the orbit for Landsat is the frequency is, or the repeat is every 16 days. So a place uh, on Earth is seen by Landsat every 16 uh, days. Now, MODIS is every day, so that there, there are more, um, um, no, this is down here, sorry, over here. So um, the, the uh, frequency or the temporal frequency at which uh, data are collected or the temporal resolution uh, vary. There are really high, uh, in this uh, white, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but in this white uh, box here, we have Digital Globe, uh, Iconos, uh, OrbView, uh, Spot, um, these are commercial satellites that collect um, data at high spatial resolution, so a few meters to uh, 10 meters, uh, and the, the repeat or the temporal resolution is, uh, can also be quite, uh, quite um, frequent or quite high, but they cost a lot of money. So, yeah, that, those are probably not not easy to um, to get uh, our hands on because um, we need funding for that. In any case, so this this graph shows you just a temporal resolution um, and spatial resolution. Um, these are not. There's we talked about the spectral resolution, so this graph doesn't include the spectral resolution, uh, which is um, also differs. Um, by by um, these um, or across these sensors, and usually the high uh, spatial resolution, uh, ten meter, four meter, one meter, the high spatial resolution, and th this is again, this is all technology at this point. <laughs> this figure is from two thousand eleven, but generally the high spatial resolution don't have um, high spectral res resolution. So only a few bands that are that have this, you know, one to four, five, ten meter resolution. Um, and then on the other side, <laughs> on the other hand, the high spectral resolution. So lots of bands, Hyperion that I mentioned, don't have high spatial resolution. So there are trade offs. So Hyperion, the high uh, spectral resolution. Um, has a spatial resolution, the pixel size is 30 meters. So yeah, so there are trade-offs between how often data are collected, um, what is the spatial resolution of the data, and then what kind of information we are getting, uh, at least for the um, optical uh, sensors, these passive sensors that I mentioned before, uh, what kind of um, spectral resolution we are getting. Okay, and um, just to, to reiterate the importance of trying to think very clearly and very carefully about how you're going to match your presence data to various um, satellite-derived uh, variables. So this figure shows you, on a, um, shows you a progression, so from 1970 to 2010, um, what kind of uh, satellites, when was the satellites uh, launched and for how long were they um, active? And MODIS is still um, function, uh, active, Landsat is still, acti act, still active. Uh, the figure um, is not, is not um, I guess, current, although it, it is from a, um, a very recent book. But anyway, so the point of this figure is to, ex to make you think about, again, when your presence data were collected, if most of your data are from the 1980s to 1990s, well, there are not that many satellites that were active and data were collected, collected during that time. So this is a big um, limitation of trying to make use of high spatial resolution or high spectral resolution data. The limitation is that if, uh, if most of our presence data or presence absence data are from before 2000, um, old, well, they're not old, 2000 is not that long ago, but if we have historical data, museum specimen data, we can't really, there's not much, there are not that many satellites that were 
uh, were active or were um, functional before the 1990s or early uh, 2000. Uh, one satellite that is not um, illustrated here is AVHRR, which was active from 80s, um, actually late 1970s, I think. Anyway, so, but these are optical sensors, um, all of them, so there are even if the data exist uh, from, uh, from older times, before 2000, um, there are just a few bands, so it's, hard, it's, it's pretty hard to work with those. Okay, so I talked quite a lot, <laughs> quite a, it took a long time to go through this uh, temporal and spatial resolution, just because I want to um, make you aware and make you uh, be very careful, think very carefully, um, invest time before you decide um, what kind of satellite data to use. And the absolute must <laughs> that, that I, try to, I try to impose on, on all my students is, and on myself, obviously I follow this, is you always have to read the metadata and always read the user guidelines. Um, we, we tend to, to just quickly download a vegetation index, for example, um, without reading more about how that vegetation, what kind of data were used for that vegetation index, when were the data collected, again, were they collected in the last three years, in the last 10 years, is it an average of 10 years, what is it? Uh, and just like with climate data, just like with any other type of uh, environmental data, we really need to invest the time, spend time to understand get to know uh, the data that uh, we are going to use so that we use those data properly and we don't make false or incorrect, incorrect assumptions about, uh, about these um, uh, environmental data that are uh, coming from uh, satellite sensors or any kind of remote sensing. Okay, so um, after I gave you a lot of warnings and <laughs> uh, um, I don't know, limitations, things to think about. Um, I do want to uh, go over a few sources of um, remotely sensed data, specifically satellite data. And I'm focusing on satellite data because uh, airborne, so data collected from, collected with an airplane, a sensor attached to an uh, airplane, those, those data, if they exist, um, they generally are um, expensive and not publicly available. So satellite data, because we have um, programs like uh, NASA or the European Space Agency, we have access to those, uh, to data collected from those satellites um, from these uh, big national or international uh, agencies. So um, the, the, this uh, very artistic illustration I took from uh, NASA, this, this shows um, the Earth science um, or the sensors, sorry, the uh, satellites carrying sensors that are used um, by um, Earth scientists. So lots of them just um, in the NASA um, portfolio or uh, NASA uh, backyard. Okay, so uh, MODIS is, like I said, the most, uh, the most, I think probably the most famous, <laughs> the most frequently used um, type of, um, of uh, sensor or the data collected uh, with MODIS are the most, uh, um, probably the, some of the most widely used data. So why are they um, so um, popular? Well, first of all, we have a long, we've now, um, accumulated or uh, NASA has accumulated um, two decades uh, of data, 2001, beginning of um, 2001 collected uh, data and some of the uh, products were started to be released um, from 2002. So almost um, two decades of data, uh, which gives us that temporal aspect that, that, that is so important for a lot of ecological studies and for ecological niche modeling. Um, there are lots and lots of products that are derived from MODIS. Um, MODIS has 36 bands, and I don't remember how many of them are in the visible, I think maybe 16 or so, I don't remember how many are in the visible near infrared and shortwave infrared. So there are a bunch of bands that uh, are not in the spectrum, that um, uh, portion of the spectrum that I mentioned. But 
So some, some very, um, I shouldn't say widely used, but quite frequently used uh, products uh, derived from, uh, from the Modi sensor are vegetation indices. So we have the normalized difference vegetation index and enhanced vegetation index. And these, if you uh, do a Google Scholar search for papers that use NDVR, EVI, you'll find hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, lots of, lots of paper used NDVI and EVI in various uh, ways, <laughs> not for, also for ecological niche modeling, but not hundreds of papers <laughs> using EVI or NDVI for ecological niche modeling. Um, and the different, EVI, uh, Enhanced Vegetation Index, is generally, um, has been um, proposed as a better uh, vegetation index for areas that have high biomass, high productivity, so tropical regions, um, the EVI, doesn't saturate as fast as NDVI in these um, high uh, productivity, high biomass um, um, regions of the earth. But anyway, so there are these two vegetation indices, NDVI and EVI. Um, talking about temporal resolution, they, uh, we can download um, products that have been um, processed every, um, have been, let's say, aggregated uh, every 16 days or monthly. So remember, Modi's data are collected every day, but then the products we are downloading are um, aggregated over 16 days or uh, over a month. And that's because there are clouds. We didn't talk about the, the biggest problem in <laughs> remote sensing, which is cloud cover. Uh, so the 16 day and monthly products are helping because um, in a um, in a period of 16 days, well, in the tropics during the rainy season, it's probably going to be cloudy uh, all 16 days. But in a month, um, there are more chances of getting some free uh, or almost cloud-free uh, days, and so that's why these um, ag that's why this aggregation is uh, is quite useful every 16 or uh, every month. Um, and then, so there are uh, for Every 16 day or every month, there are vegetation indices from 2000 until current, present. They are still being produced every, um, for every year. So you, if you download 16 day uh, NDVI, let's say, for a whole year, you will download a lot of data. <laughs> so think about, do I need a uh, um, vegetation index every 60 day, 16 days? or do I need a monthly vegetation index that then I will probably average over you know, five years or 10 years or how many years of presence data I have. So processing, yeah, think about <laughs> carefully about how you are processing, how you are um, um, aggregating or averaging uh, these um, uh, high frequency data. And then, the, so that was the um, temporal resolution. Uh, spatial resolution, uh, we have vegetation indices uh, generated at 250 meters and then um, um, generated at 500 meters or one kilometer. So if I do a continental scale analysis, I'm not gonna, probably not going to use the 250 meter product because it will be really hard to work with a continental scale 250 meter NDVI or EVI. The, um, the processing time will be running a niche model and 250 meter resolution in, for the whole um, I don't know, North American continent would be, um, or any large area would be quite, quite difficult and probably unnecessary. So also, you know, when you download these data, make sure you, ch you choose the right, um, the right resolution for the question you are, you are trying to answer. Okay, so that's vegetation indices. Then there is leaf area index and then fractional photosynthetically, uh, active radiation. So this is um, telling us, so leaf area index is about um, kind of about canopy um, cover uh, and then how active um, is that, how productive is, uh, uh, is that vegetation. Um, so these, these uh, products are every four day and every eight day. <laughs> Uh, at 500 uh, meter resolution and starting with uh, the product, these products were generated starting 2002. Um, so if you get into these um, more 
kind of productivity type uh, variables, uh, you have even more processing to do because you're not going to work with uh, an environmental variable that is every four days. Um, you'll have to, you will, again, a, um, average over uh, months uh, of data. Okay, the next one is gross primary productivity and net primary productivity. Um, these are um, created at, also at 500, resolu 500 meter resolution, uh, 2000, from, also from 2002, like the previous ones. Um, and it's also quite, um, the, uh, the uh, temporal resolution is quite high every eight days. Similarly with evapotranspiration, although evapotranspiration, there is a product that is uh, produced or averaged for a whole year, the same resolution. And then, and then we get into land cover, which is generated every year. Um, and the finest resolution is uh, 500 meters. And then finally, um, vegetation continuous fields is one product that is quite interesting because it gives us in a pixel how, um, how much of that pixel, how much of that 250 meter pixel is tree cover, how much is non-tree vegetation, and how much is non-vegetated. So percent tree cover versus percent vegetation that is not tree, so anything uh, else, and then percent that is no, that has no vegetation. Um, so it's a, it gives you a percentage uh, of these three classes per uh, 250 meter pixel, and it's a yearly uh, product. And for some reason, I don't know, I should read, <laughs> for some reason the, the um, production or generation of, of, this, uh, of this product, the vegetation continuous fields, stopped in uh, 2013. Anyway, so these are some of the um, uh, products that are based or generated from uh, the MODIS uh, data collection. Um, and I'll show you the website where you can get, you can see other, um, what other types of, um, of um, products are derived from all this. There is um, uh, surface temperature. I can't remember now the, the name of the, um, the, the product, but it's at a, quite a coarse resolution because it's using a, a thermal band. So anyways, uh, there are, this looks like a long list. The list is actually quite, <laughs> quite a bit longer, and yeah, you have to read and, and understand what these what these um, products are. But they are all generated through from that uh, one um, sensor, the MODIS sensor. Okay, so then um, the la the other uh, types of sources of satellite data that I'm mentioning here are. Um, compilation of things, <laughs> of data that I might have used at some point in time. So um, there is a global land cover um, that has been generated yearly uh, from uh, 1992. So the, the MODIS, the MODIS uh, land cover product starts in 2002. This one goes uh, back to, or starts in uh, 1992 uh, and stops in 2015 and it has um, a resolution of uh, 300 meters. And it's not one satellite, but it's actually um, an aggregation or a data fusion of uh, five different uh, satellites. Uh, the nighttime lights um, is another product that I've seen used, and I, I um, well, Luis and I used it once. Um, and it's, it's a good surrogate, I guess, I think. <laughs> That's why we used it a good surrogate for um, development. Um, and so this is also a yearly product and you can download um, one kilometer resolution uh, products from 1992 to 2013. Uh, it's, it's slightly harder to work with these, uh, with the nighttime um, lights, um, the, because the, um, the format that you download that data um, is a bit is a bit cumbersome to work with. So be patient if you decide to use a nighttime lights. Uh, global human footprint um, is um, an average. Um, and the last, I, I don't know if there is a newer iteration of this of this prod, of this uh, data set, but the footprint, the global human footprint that I used um, 
represented um, an average of 1995 to 2004 in uh, at one kilometer resolution. It in, and it includes or it, it fuses um, a, a bunch of data to come up with this uh, human footprint, which, which is a measure of how impacted uh, each one kilometer pixel is by uh, human development or presence of humans. And then there is elevation from um, radar, um, um, a radar um, satellite, um, and it has a 90 meter uh, resolution globally. Now, of course, um, if your um, if your extent of the study area, if you are working with a large study area these resolutions 90 meter elevation um, data set would be would be too much to work with it would be too fine of a resolution so again remember think about what kind of spatial resolution you need you might not need 90 meter resolution and actually you cannot work with uh, you cannot have your computer is not gonna work well with these uh, high resolution 90 meter resolution at large uh, large extents uh, you know, regional to continental, it's, it's not going to be uh, possible or easy to work with. Okay, um, lastly, I wanted to mention specifically within uh, NASA, uh, the Earth Science Data part of program or, or branch of NASA. Uh, and within the um, Earth Science Data, I wanted to mention these um, distributed active archive centers. So I'm here, I'm showing you the land processes distributed active archive center uh, because it has, um, it handles, handles or, or uh, services and distributes most of the data that we, uh, terrestrial ecologists would be interested uh, in. And I apologize for the uh, aquatic, uh, freshwater or marine ecologists, but I didn't include um, those data, those um, DACs that, that manage those data. So for land processes, so this uh, LP DAC has all the MODIS data, has um, Landsat data, has Aster data, lots and lots of data. Um, about 240 products, a lot, of, a lot of data, and it has hundreds of thousands of users. My, my recommendation or my suggestion would be to join their listserv because their listserv, uh, they send out uh, periodically announcements of new, new data sets uh, generated or if, um, if they find some errors in a, a data set that was released, then they have, they Post, they send out an announcement that we should be careful about using this particular data. So this isn't, luckily this hasn't happened that often. I think I've seen a couple of, of such announcements in the last maybe three, four years. So that's good. But new data um, are um, announced through this listserv. Any new tools, any new um, tutorials that they release um, are announced through this listserv. So I would, I highly recommend joining this. And then I will mention. I wanted to mention this e-learning. Let's see if we can go there. Um, this website. This is uh, so. This is again part of um, LP Land Processes uh, DAC. So this is where you can learn, for example, learn about a new a new sensor, EcoStress. Um, uh, learn about how to. Um, use Landsat workflow in an a API. Um, so all kinds of um, everything that uh, all the tutorials, any uh, any um, training that that uh, land processes uh, creates or generates uh, is um, is posted here. So you have you know lots and lots of um, so uh, sources of information and uh, learning. Uh, to do. Okay, go back to this. Um, yeah, I should have gone to this, uh, show you the, this website, uh, their general website, but um, I think I'm probably running out of time. Okay, so how to ask, access the data that are um, 
managed and archived by the Land Processes DAC, LP DAC. There is direct access to product files. Uh, you can search for data. So these are um, some options. But then um, I think the star of their, uh, of their um, tools is this appears because it, um, it is generating, um, oops, sorry, it is, it is um, doing a lot of processing that a long time ago when I was a graduate student, I had to do, um, I had to stitch together various um, ArcGIS um, or even Envy um, pieces in order to in order to be able to use the data. So appears this tool. We'll go quickly uh, over that website. Um, has streamlined, has um, reduced, has eliminated a lot of headaches. So um, all the clipping, um, mosaicing of various tiles, reprojection, all of that is done on their servers uh, and what you get is a nice raster of say vegetation um, NDVI one vegetation index a nice raster that has been uh, processed for you and you just download one raster as opposed to downloading pieces that you have to you have to um, uh, stitch you have to uh, mosaic and um, change projection and so on and so forth so this has been a super huge time saver, especially for me who's not Google Earth Engine uh, enabled. So I don't, and I don't have those kinds of tools um, or those kinds of skills, I should say. Um, so for me, this has been quite, quite fun to use. So you'll have to create an account um, to, um, it's a free account. It will create an account with, if you want to use Appears, you can create an account. Uh, what I wanted to show, let me see if I can show this without logging in. I guess I do have to log in. Um, ooh, and I did change my username, I guess. Or the password. I wanted to show you. Um, the metadata or the information. Oh, and you get to see what I've been playing with. But what I wanted to show you is the available products list. So here, of course, you have to know a little bit of what you are looking for, right? So here, for example, do I want the, um, the, the two? <laughs> I didn't mention that there are two modis, um, sensors that are in tandem, or I should say uh, satellites that are in tandem, Aqua and um, Terra over here. So it gets a bit more complicated, but uh, you have to, what I was gonna say is that you have to know what you're looking for, um, or if you have time, well, if you are in the process of learning about satellite data, uh, you can spend time uh, checking all these uh, types of data. So if we go to uh, Terra Modis, um, we see surface reflectance, a product that is surface, surface reflectance. I should also mention that because there are so many MODIS products, um, they, are, they, have, they have various, uh, well, not various, they have identifiers. So if I know the identifier for vegetation index, I can just look for it, but I don't know the identifier, so I'm just gonna, you know, scroll, hopefully find it soon, fast. I guess, I guess you get to see how many, okay, so here it is. At one kilometer resolution, you get to see how many um, products they, they have. Um, but so here is one kilometer resolution, EVI, NDVI. So if I download this product, I will get, um, I will have to select which, which of these uh, layers, let's say, uh, I download. But what I wanted to show you is when you click on this, hopefully it's going to work. When you click on the link, uh, of that particular uh, product, you want to learn more. As I said, you need to read <laughs> about each data set. So you click on that, and then it takes you to a description of the product, characteristics, layers. So when you download, what are you getting? You're getting uh, 16 days NDVI, and it tells you what are the valid ranges, so on and so forth. So anyways, all the information is there. We just have to spend time uh, dedicate time to uh, learn. Oh, and I should have shown you actually um, the 
tool, I guess over here. So if I go back to, we can, we can check one that I downloaded. Uh, oh, that expired. Okay, so this was for, I helped a colleague download. I actually don't remember what data he needed. Oh, uh, the how much vegetated, non-vegetated, so on. Um, the uh, ve vegetation continuous field product. So I helped him download this. What I wanted to show is that you can draw, you can just draw um, a, a polygon around the area that, that you want to download data from. You can also, um, let's, let's start with a new, um, a new um, request. So you name the area sample, then you drag a shape file in here, or if you know how to, you can use a JSON. I don't use that, uh, that type of file. Um, and then you have your start and end date, um, and then the product that you wanna download. So if I, if I type Modis, I will start seeing all the Modis uh, data sets. Well, there are a lot of Modis um, products, I should say. Okay, uh, but then I can, I can also, if I want to draw a, a rectangle or a polygon, I can also draw a polygon or a rectangle. I usually just uh, drag my uh, zipped shape file into, um, into this um, interface. So as I said, lots of data, um, and this is just one, um, one big, but one, <laughs> one uh, source of, of satellite data, but we have to, you know, you have to investigate and figure out which one you want to use. I think LPDAC is one manageable, um, manageable way of, of getting into uh, remotely sensed data. And it, like I said, it, it, it has a lot of the frequently used products like uh, the MODIS, MBVI, EVI, and other vegetation uh, products. Now, if you are brave, um, you can go into the, the big catalog of everything that NASA has ever collected. So this NASA Earth data is quite daunting to use because it has absolutely everything that, that they are um, distributing. So if I put here vegetation, Okay, so if I put here vegetation, I have 1,000 <laughs> possible <laughs> uh, products to, to go through. Um, so you have to be a bit more specific here. That's why I, I, I don't think you should start with the, um, the catalog of the entire NASA, <laughs> NASA collection because it's pretty daunting. Uh, and I had conversations, uh, I'm on a user group for, for the land processes uh, DAC. Um, and we had a conversation with other, um, other DACs, other, uh, other data ar uh, archive centers. And yeah, the discussion was that this, you know, NASA tried really hard to make an interface that is, that is very comprehensive, that has everything they have in one, because we kept complaining that we had to go on multiple websites, multiple uh, NASA websites to get data. And I said, okay, here it is. And now we are starting to complain that this is too complex, too much to, to use. So if I want to find precipitation, we didn't talk about precipitation of temperature. There are 995 ma uh, matches. So clearly you have to know a little bit more about what is it that you're looking for because you're not going to scroll uh, or try to, to dig through 900 and so. And same happens with if, if you try to find temperature. Again, a lot of <laughs> a lot of uh, possibilities, many of which are not are not uh, useful for you. So, uh, because of resolution, uh, spatial resolution, or temporal resolution, there is also another interface that well has been around since I think since I was in grad school. I, I'm pretty sure it was around. Um, in the, let's say, at least mid to late 2000s. I think this one, uh, Earth Explorer, will eventually go away. Um, it has, um, again, you have, to know, you have to know what data set you're looking for. You cannot search for 
temperature or precipitation. You have to know, um, I think we don't have time but to show it, but you have to know what kind of, if you're looking for Aster data or MODIS data, specifically what kind of data you're, you're looking for. Okay, so finally, I wanted to mention, you know, for those of you, of you who want to learn more, want to invest time um, and learn about uh, remote sensing in general, or specifically the types of remote uh, sensing data that NASA has. Um, there is an entire program that NASA has for this pur purpose. Um, so applied remote sensing training uh, is their branch of training outreach, um, educating us about data and uses and whatnot. So um, they also have um, webinars, training, um, and everything is actually archived. So if you go to their website, um, you, can, uh, you can find a lot more um, sources of education and studying and, and learning. So this has been covering, I try to cover just satellite data and just passive remote sensing, no active remote sensing, no LIDAR, none of that, uh, radar or LIDAR, none of that. And it's still quite a lot. And I, we just, we just uh, scraped the surface of, of what exists. Um, there's also more coming up. So the exciting development in the remote sensing world, or at least the, ex <laughs> the development that I think is exciting uh, and I see uh, other people getting excited about this is, so the development is the, uh, are these uh, sensors that are now placed on, uh, on the International Space Station. So the International Space Station orbiting the Earth now has uh, a sensor, sensor called EcoStress, which uh, is a NASA sensor that, that uh, was launched, I think, a year and a half ago or so, and it collects um, evapotranspiration data that is used to generate evapotranspiration and other products related to uh, vegetation health or um, ecosystem processes, something like that. <laughs> um, and then the newest addition, uh, well, there is also a, multi, well, a hyperspectral sensor um, that, that covers the visible to near infrared. So uh, only to 1,000 nanometer. It doesn't go into 2,000 uh, uh, after in the um, short wave infrared. So there is eco stress. Um, there is um, DESIS, I think it's called. I don't remember the um, hyperspectral sensor. And then there is a lidar sensor that um, now is uh, generating products. And those uh, those are you can find at least the LIDAR and the EcoStress. So LIDAR is called JEDI. Um, so you can find those, uh, you can download those data from, uh, from that LP DAC, um, the land processes DAC that I, that I mentioned and spent quite a, quite a time on it. But this is to say that you are not downloading, with the exception of Mo MODIS products, you, are, you will not be downloading a raster that you can then plug immediately into an ecological niche modeling or S or species distribution modeling algorithm. There's a lot of post-processing, even with, with the tools that already exist in place in, um, for example, for MODIS, um, there's a lot of work still to be done and understanding of what you're doing. So there is a learning curve, but um, I think if you are comfortable working with rasters and a little bit, you're having a little bit of uh, GIS experience, I think it's, it's doable. Um, before you invest a lot of time <laughs> trying to find remotely sensed data, do think about whether your question requires remotely sensed data and whether your presence data can be used, used with remotely sensed data. Because if present data are from, are historical, then you cannot, historical meaning pre-2000, um, you cannot really make great use of, of uh, remotely sensed data in, um, in an ecological niche modeling framework. So I think this is all I had to um, tell you about. Uh, I try to be brief, but I'm never brief. Uh, I hope this was, uh, this was useful. And um, 
I will be available for um, questions and answers uh, next Friday. I will pay attention to, um, to the uh, Google uh, spreadsheet that Town has. So I hope this was useful. Bye.